This Opus of Triloquy is brought to you by Roundtable, your hub for live and on-demand digital courses in music, literature, the arts, and more. Triloquy listeners are invited to a world-class music education, including diving deeper into music theory, celebrating Nina Simone, and studying Schumann and Chopin with renowned expert Louis Rosen. Go to roundtable.org music and use the code LOKI20 for 20% off any course, especially for Triloquy listeners. I'm Loki Karuna, and this is Triloquy. Greetings and happy October. So glad that you decided to join me here once again. To returning listeners, thank you so much for your continued support of the show. To new listeners, welcome to the party. Triloquy is a show that's built to decolonize the idea of classical music, where I take a look at what's going on out there in the field. I share dialogues with people who are shifting the status quo of the genre in their own ways. And I share a weekly Triloquy where I offer what I can to inspire you to challenge the norms of classical music and our world in general. For more information on Triloquy, to check out past opuses and to donate, Go over to our website, T-R-I-L-L-O-Q-U-Y dot O-R-G. I'm really excited to share my recent dialogue with actor and playwright June Carroll today. She's working on an opera that you'll hear more about in a bit. And in today's Triloquy, I'm going to speak on the violence in the Middle East. But for right now, I want to just take a couple of minutes to offer uh, updates on stories that I shared here in the past few weeks, things moving along. You might remember that not too long ago, WCPE-FM in Raleigh, North Carolina, made a statement that they wouldn't be broadcasting the Met Opera's performances, at least a number of them this season, um, as most, you know, classical music stations do, especially on Saturdays. Uh, WCPE said they wouldn't be broadcasting these operas because of the content, the adult content, and the so-called non-classical aesthetics and themes of uh, works like Dead Man Walking and uh, Anthony Davis's Malcolm X inspired opera. So of course, this was a bit upsetting (laughs) for me, but not surprising because this is what classical institutions do, right? They exclude. Well, the people spoke up and spoke out and things have indeed shifted a bit. I'm reading here from the New York Times headline, North Carolina radio station won't ban Met Opera broadcast after all. It says the music director of a nonprofit North Carolina classical radio station said on Thursday that the station would reverse course and air several contemporary operas being performed by the Metropolitan Opera this season that the station had originally said were unsuitable for broadcast, citing their, quote, adult themes and harsh language. Quote, it was a very hard decision, says Emily Ross, the music director of WCPE. Um, And she says it's been a hard day and a hard week. The reversal came after the station faced widespread criticism. So I have to admit that this was a little bit of a surprise for me. We've seen people do their best to shame classical institutions when they misstep. But more often than not, These institutions just wait for the storm to pass. Consider the Josh Jones drama at the Kansas City Symphony or even what I went through a few years back at Minnesota Public Radio. Backlash isn't typically something that I'm used to seeing a response to from these institutions. But, you know, the people spoke up and now thousands more in North Carolina will have the opportunity to hear what the Met is trying to do and platforming new music toward engaging broader audiences. You'll remember that Scott and I talked about last season, the fact that the Met went into their endowment, I think something like $30 million to uh, help fund these new works. So, you know, it's really important work. Say what you want about the Met. I've said plenty about the Met here on this show, but, you know, they're trying to push things along. And, you know, uh, this radio station down in uh, North Carolina wasn't playing ball, but, you know, again, the people spoke up and, and now they'll get to hear it. So I, I think that's some uh, really good news for uh, for us to think about and to share uh, this week. Since I'm actually here in New York, I'm trying to go see Malcolm X live, but who girl, those tickets are a little steep. So I'm looking for my hookup. If you know someone who works at the Met and can get me two decent orchestra level seats, at least for a cheaper price than what they're right, what, what they're listed right now, connect me. Y'all know where to find me. So <laughs> there's that. 
Um, and then there's also the story that I shared a while back about the conductor at the Cleveland Institute of Music. Uh, so apparently he was being verbally abusive to students, which resulted in a student strike at the beginning of this school year. Some of the people who led investigations into this conductor's behavior were dismissed from their jobs. And it looked like this was going to be, you know, yet another instance of a conductor getting to do whatever he wanted to do with no repercussions. We see that a lot in the field. Well, there's also been a shift there. I'm reading from OperaWire.com with the headline, Carlos Calmar put on leave of absence by Cleveland Institute of Music. It says, Carlos Calmar, the principal conductor and director of the orchestral studies at the Cleveland Institute of Music, has been put on leave of absence for the remainder of the semester. The news comes after students protested the conductor. Per reports, students attended rehearsals without instruments while others sat in the audience to support their colleagues and fellow students. Students also circulated a petition against Against Kalmar. As a result of the student protests on September 26, um, their uh, uh, protests, a September 26 performance, rather, which was to be conducted by Kalmar, was canceled. Uh, in his absence uh, at the school will be Samir Patel of the La Jolla Symphony and Chorus and Anthony Parther of the San Bernardino Symphony Orchestra. Kalmar was previously accused of sexual harassment, but the institution cleared him after conducting an internal investigation. So shout out to Samir and Anthony. Um, these are two conductors uh, who I've had the pleasure of working with. I hope they do the students well. But once again, Again, we're seeing that organized outcries and protests have resulted in something positive for those who were calling foul. I have to say, this is very encouraging for me as classical musicians and professionals. I think we're trained to adhere to the stratification of power that exists throughout the industry and throughout the culture, whether you're talking about how orchestras run to administration to, you know, how radio hosts have to bow down or, you know, they think they have to bow down <laughs> to program directors or just about anything you can think of. Um, it's been a little rough for me lately thinking about how much these institutions aren't changing, but seeing the people being the catalyst of change in these two instances is something that's refueling me this week, and I hope it can do the same for you. So uh, don't be afraid to speak out and to speak up and to organize in your life or on your job. It's the only way we're going to get somewhere, as these two stories portray. So with that, I'd like to shift uh, us to my dialogue with June Carroll. Uh, so June is working with a team to produce an opera based on a play that she wrote called The Life and Death of. The opera um, is going to be titled My Wings Burned Off. Both of these works tell the story of Oluwatoyin Salau, who was raped and murdered in Florida, a black woman uh, with basically no news coverage or public outcry of the incident. Uh, June felt like this story needed to be told. So after producing the play, she partnered with composer Jason Paraba to turn this into an opera. So we talk a little about that, the life of a black playwright and lots more. I really enjoyed this dialogue. Uh, I thought I'd frame the dialogue today, both the intro and the outro, with excerpts from a work uh, that I think I've shared here before. It's called Say Her Name, music by Alicia Lee, uh, performed here by Alicia alongside the University of Michigan choruses. So I hope you'll think about the names you believe need to be said, including that of Oluwatoy and Salau, as you listen to this and get into my dialogue with June Carroll. Say her name, say her name, say her name, she cannot be forgotten by us, say her name, say her name, say her name, say her name, put her name in the air, put her name You know, Denver was a beautiful uh, place to live growing up. I lived in what's called Montbello, which is in Northeast Denver. It's, um, it was mixed, racially mixed, Black and uh, Mexican-American primarily um, and white, but majority Black and uh, Latino. And so for that reason... Uh, we got that way because real estate agents, when I was, uh, I guess, in my, my, I, when I was really little, they figured they would just ship all the black people over there. As a result, uh, it was assumed that we were the ghetto. In fact, mm -hmm. we were the slums. 
And uh, it would be really funny because we would be sitting here going, did you hear it? He's high. The curse and the bloods. <laughs> they come in this way. And we'd be like, oh, I hope they don't come over here. Um, <laughs> that wasn't us. You know, that wasn't us. And so I'll never forget uh, one time. Um, I can't even remember what the event was for, but some sort of speech and debate thing. And some high schoolers from across town, a uh, white high school, they pull up. All the kids are plastered against the window. Jaws drop because they were expecting to be, I don't know if they were expecting burning tires and, <laughs> you know, bodies in the streets or what, but they got off the bus and uh, to a person were just like, this is, this is not Bella. Yeah, this is my, yeah, we're the, yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, going to a uh, majority black high school was, um, I think you, you, your peers can be your, your hardest critics. Mm-hmm. So it was, um, for me being a nerd, being, uh, very quiet, um, being, uh, very, 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 very shy. Um, it was uh, it was hard, but um, the one thing we didn't have, the one thing I didn't go through, was feeling less than. Mm. You know, we found out that, like these kids who would assume that we were of uh, the ghetto, we we just we, we were like, no, we're 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 it. You know, our high school is the the place to be. Our uh, team, our, our basketball team, our football team, you know, we had Craig Johnson, Craig Jackson was one of our star basketball players, Maurice Freelo, star football player, went to Harvard, um, you know, and, you know, his sister went to Harvard, um, you know, we, we didn't cotton that, you know, we didn't have that, we didn't have that, um, so it was, it was, it was a great place to grow up in terms of, uh, escaping from the the intensity that could be the rest of Denver, um, which, as beautiful as it was, was still Colorado. Mm. Uh, um, very, very much not the progressive mecca that uh, I hear it is now. <laughs> very much not. You know, the police in Denver, we used to say, L.A. cops have nothing on Denver cops. Wow. Yeah, yeah. Wow. the racism was just, you know, because it's the West. So you just, you know, you, you, you know, it was the wet, it was the Wild West. Um, lots of assumptions growing up about us where we where we were, but I wouldn't trade it. I I I don't live there now because that's not it's it doesn't help me with my career. But I wouldn't trade growing up there for anything really. And I know that you had a little bit of a detour into political science before really realizing your your true calling. But I wonder if this sort of black Mecca that you're describing to be in Colorado set you up uh, for your artistic career. Did you have the example of learning about black writers, uh, black uh, poets? What, what Was that a part of that upbringing for you? Well, you know, what's funny is I'm first generation American. African and West Indian. And so my influences are actually um, like my mother, my mother was, uh, she died when I was 19, but, and my father uh, who, my mother was a nutritionist, uh, got her PhD in nutrition and dietetics and uh, was from Guyana and had gone from Guyana to uh, England and then settled in New York and then New York, no, to Denver. So our influences were actually more Caribbean, hmm. uh, but uh, and uh, uh, African, and I think the idea of doing anything less than stellar in school wasn't it wasn't enforced like this negative thing. It was just it's what you do. Mm-hmm. You, know, you you go to you go to college because and I don't know how you do it, but you go to college. And I don't know what you study, but I don't I don't care what my mother, I found out, um, told my sister once, I don't care what you study as long as you're happy. Um, it was actually at Brown that I got my education in um 
uh, uh, Black culture. But what I got in Denver was my history teacher, Miss Piasek, Barbara Piasek. She was hilarious. And between her and my social studies teacher in eighth grade, they gave us the, the, they hipped us to what was happening in the United States. We read the Federalist Papers. We read Black Elk Speaks. We read um, Howard Zinn's History of America, you know, you know uh, History of the United States. Uh, you know, it was my uh, eighth grade uh, social studies teacher who was like, listen, just so you know, the trend is when, as you're, when you're younger, you are more liberal, but as you get older, you will turn more. And, but mm-hmm. he gave, you know, this is an option. It's not what's going to happen. But these two people just, we soaked up so much history. Thank to, thanks to these two people. Um, what the United States is really about. And that is really what I think set me up for political science because I already knew, I already knew it all. Um, and like my mom's best friend, Lejeune Bradford, she was also a nutritionist and she taught me about um, the, 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 uh, the Red Scare. And mm-hmm. she had been blacklisted. She was a black woman, very light skinned black woman, grew up in Chicago, um, who we would talk about politics. You know, that was that was the, the daily fare in our household. And when she was over, we'd talk about politics, we'd talk about you know literature, we talked about all these we talked about the world. Yeah. You know. Um, and so yeah, I was actually prepared for uh political science, I thought. Um <laughs> by my upbringing in denver yeah my my in my education in denver well wow. the the question that comes to my mind is about this disparity between the success rate or even just the expectations for black people who are not from the united states versus afro americans you know i'm i was born in 1987 and i'm a first generation college graduate you know there are still first generation young people who are first generation college graduates out here how how have you engaged that narrative because and as we'll talk about you know when um when it comes to just systemic issues black is black in many cases yep. but if you really dig deeper there's so many nuances there to explore i mean the expectation in my household was to do well enough to graduate and get a job the, the yep. expectation was not to go get higher degrees and all that sort of thing mm-hmm. um i mean it's kind of um that's the wrestling match that's what i grew up um trying to figure out um, because, um, there, despite being in a household where that was the college was the norm, not for, because, you know, Caribbean, you, you, you got to, you got to get to a job. You got to make sure that you get this. You got to make sure you get that. You get the host, you get the, the car, you get the, you know, that was just the way it was when you were an immigrant mm-hmm. You're by your own volition. And I think what I finally figured out was when a culture tells you it doesn't want you and does its best to destroy you, Mm -hmm. um, it may not work because Black people haven't gone anywhere. Black folks haven't gone anywhere. But that's a hard narrative to fight. And you are kind of on your own because you look around you and the buildings are about someone other than you. Mm. The literature is about someone other than you. Television is about someone, anyone other than you. Everywhere you turn, you're living in a society that says you are non-existent. You, you are body, you are blood and flesh. You are flesh and blood. And yet you open a, a textbook, you're, and this was my experience, you're History starts on in chapter, what was it? I think it was chapter 10. Uh, and it went for 10 paragraphs. So that's not even five pages. And I, as an outsider, I was always aware that I was an outsider. I was always aware that I 
didn't have the same history. And what I grew up with was, yeah, we got rid of the white folks in, you know, <laughs> It's not the white folks, but we got rid of we got rid of the colonialists in the 1800s. So mm-hmm. yeah, not a thing for us. But it was replaced with a different kind of racism, certainly. Um, but to answer your question, um, when people <laughs> like people who talk about, well, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps. It's it's it it, it happened back then. Why are you still thinking about it now? Well, you try living in a world that tells you you don't exist. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, you do. That is, it is precise, and it is precisely that fear that so many people militate against when they're like, when they when they say things like "you won't replace us," uh, when they say things like uh, they're they're upset with cancel culture. What they're saying is they don't want to be accountable and live in the way that they have imposed on other people. History and how it's taught has a consequence. I'm not saying um, it can't be outrun, but you are running. Oh, yeah. You are running. Um, I, I just, I mean, I think I defy anyone to grow up in the United States and not be affected by it. it when first generation... 10th generation. It doesn't matter. It was like when I, I got to, I got to college and, um, where suddenly on the one hand, this whole new world opened up for me. Right. Um, everybody was sitting on the green. They were talking about politics. Everybody was sitting on the green and they were listening to, you know, the music that I listened to. Everybody was on the green and they were marching and protesting and it was beautiful and amazing. And all of a sudden one day I was sitting in an Amer- American civilization class and somebody brought up um, uh, affirmative action and the, I had sudden um, fear because I went to Brown University that I was only there because I was black, mm. not because I was smart, not because I'd earned it, not because I was qualified. It's just those people who brought me into their home and sat across from me and smiled and said how impressive I was, they were lying to me. They 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 were shining me on. I mean that's an expensive shine on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and but then but then and when I look at it now, because when I think about like a Clarence Thomas who's so angry. Yep. about the concept that he got a hand up, a, a hand, a helping hand, that he will squash it for everyone coming after him. There's a part of me that goes, you know what? However you get there, because white people do it. What is legacy? Uh, what is the legacy hire? What is the legacy? Exactly. Uh, you know, uh, student anyway. What is that other than? If they can do it, why shouldn't we? whatever it takes and the stigma that I think he just soaked up and it is in his veins, I think is, um, I'm not saying it's, 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 I'm not saying it's easy to just bat it away, but it's not true. It's not true. However you get there, you deserve to be there. However you get there, you've earned the right to be there. I don't know how I ended up on this soapbox. I'm kind of down. <laughs> but, um, yeah. I mean, my argument is that you have to go through so much being Black in America. If somebody gives me something for being Black, so be it. I earned it. <laughs> <laughs> Even though we know that's not the case. I, I think you're absolutely right. It's like, wait, I'm I'm getting this because I'm black. Bet. <laughs> <laughs> I will take it. Please and thank you. May I have some more? Because it's hard enough in this country. And you know, I th- I think when I when I think about like the divide between African Americans, first generation Americans, immigrant Americans, um, it's like there's this pie slice. And it's very small. And we are told to, we're held, you know, in the cage. And it's, we're starved. And then somebody rings a bell. They loosen the chains. Everybody shoots for this one little piece of the pie. Mm -hmm. 
it's by design and it's insidious and it um, divides us in a way that I think is so toxic and so tragic. You know, it's like even things like who owns his, who owns our history. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll, for, I'll never forget a friend in college getting really upset with me because he is, he is African American and white and European American. And he wanted very badly, you know, to say, well, Africa is this and Africa is this and Africa is this. And it's like, I have an African father. Africa is not that. Africa is not that. Africa is not that. Africa is a lot of things. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of people. It's a lot of places. It's a lot of languages. It's a lot of beliefs. It's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of history. And I remember feeling very proprietary about it, you know, because it was like, man, you're talking to an African. What are you talking about? Yep. Talking to an African, sort of. Because I'm still, I still was. I'm an African who was raised in the United States, mm. so that's a whole another mind yep. trip. Um, but I remember how angry he was when I wouldn't sort of release the idea of Africa as a monolith, and I remember how angry I was at him for seeing Africa as a monolith. And then I step back now and I'm like, wow, we all got, we all just got messed up. We have I mean, been, look. It was, it was taken from us, you know, mm-hmm. but we, I, I wish, you know, one of the biggest things of my life, I wish I could tell people, well, you know, my ancestors came from such and such where they spoke this language and X, Y, and Z. I won't do the ancestry because I feel like they're building DNA robots of everybody. So, <laughs> hey, I mean, hey, come on, just the same. <laughs> Not my blood. <laughs> but for all of the difficulties that um, Black folks have to go through in this country, when you add artist on top of that i feel like it's even more difficult because i don't care what color you are artists aren't handed anything we have to work for every single thing that we get yeah How, why did you decide to go down that road <laughs> what were you thinking honestly i found my power as an artist um political science was wonderful for what it was um the the, the facts and figures i could do without and as a result, I floundered for four years and got to you know graduation and was sitting across from my teammate because I was in, I was a fencer. I was sitting across from my teammate Alex in the uh, political science um, library after the graduation ceremony, and I looked at him and he looked at me, and we kind of leaned over and we're like, "Who are all these people?" <laughs> I love the theory of um, because my 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 concentration was the law. Uh, 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 I was going to study criminal justice and become a a DA, and then I was going to be a Supreme Court justice. And then I found out that the law is the only what is the person who wins. That's what's true. Truth is only who wins. And I couldn't in, I, there has to, there has to be a right. There has to be a wrong, but I still had this thing. So I had this thing where I was seeing the world in a way and couldn't articulate what it was I was seeing. And all of a sudden I, so I transferred out of um, political science, took a year to transition into English literature and started taking literature, literary, uh, literary criticism courses. And I figured it out. That's what's wrong with me. I'm interpreting the world. I'm interpreting in the world the world in a very different way. And so the minute I was able to figure out, June, you're not seeing things. You're seeing different things. Mm. I started to find my, my mojo. And then I got drafted into a playwriting class because um, I took this survey course, drama survey course, wrote a play for my midterm, the pl- teacher Paula Vola at the time was like hey do you want to take a playwriting class I was like yes 
did that. We wrote a, uh, a soap opera for our midterm. It was midterm, so nobody was available. Mm-hmm. So we all got drafted into the play. That was the beginning of my acting and writing career. And I figured out that where in political science and law, right is who wins. The story is... The, sto- the story that you're telling is can be life or death. I didn't want that responsibility. I said, if I'm going to tell stories, if I'm going to fabricate, I want to make the world. I want to see myself in the world. I can't do that in political science because nobody cares about my, 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 um, my interpretation of the world. But when I'm in, when I'm at my computer writing, when I am on stage as an actor, I say what the world is. And my truth, I can speak it. And every so often, somebody on the other side says, yeah, I hear that. That's my truth too. Or... That's not my truth, but I appreciate that. Let's talk. So the reason I went into art was because it kind of saved my life. Mm. Basically saved my life. It certainly saved my sanity. Now, it's interesting for me to hear you talk about, you know, creating your own narrative because so much of the work that you do artistically is a reflection of what's going on in the world. So, you know, notably, uh, your play, The Life and Death of. I wonder if you could speak to why you decide, considering what you just shared, why you decided to write a play that tells that story. Um, it's a play with 16 actors, and um, it is, for me, the opportunity for blackness and femaleness to come together Mm -hmm. and tell the truth. Mm. What happened to this young woman up to her passing, her being robbed of life has happened in various shapes and in various ways to many of us who are black and female, then split that again to orient, you know, sexual orientation, um, and to, uh, 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 cis versus trans. Right. You know, it was, I'm not trying to say that she is me because that would be insulting. But when she, I saw there's a, a um, clip of her. Her name was Oluwatoy in Salau. There was a clip of her in, during a march. She was standing in this circle and people were cheering her on. And she said, because I will die black. And that was, she did, mm-hmm. and we do, you know. Um, I wanted to thank her. I wanted to apologize to her. Um, I wanted to eulogize her, and I wanted her to know that she was seen and heard. And this was the only way I could figure out how to do it. And selfishly, it meant also putting some of my, ugh, out there. Some of what wounds me, you know, some of being perpetually, and I, you know this, being perpetually invisible. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, again, going back to being flesh and blood and not existing. It's like, I know I'm here. And it's like I'm screaming into the void because I I can't 
seem to make myself understood um, and well enough to feel safe all the time the way other people do. You know, as it happens, this was a woman. But I think that being black is, if you're, there is something insane about being black in America. There is something insane about it because you walk, you talk, you live, you breathe, you, you know, you've got flesh, you, you got blood pumping in your veins. And for the life of you, you can't prove you belong for the life of you. And every so often, you know, the world sort of like gets dinged and sort of like shapes up and the world starts to say, oh, we feel bad. So we're going to throw a little bit of, you know, money away so that you can be black and get something for being black. And then it goes right back to tilting and you're invisible again. And I think that it got her killed. And I think the man who did it was so full of his own pain and hatred that he, it poisoned him too. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Toyin's story is one that unfortunately so many people just don't know, have, have never heard her name. Do the people who need to hear her name, will they hear it through the development of My Wings Burned Off, the opera inspired by your play? That is my hope, but I know that, you know, um, art being what it is, people will make of it what it, what they will you know i think that we have to name her in the opera i think that that's um because it happens in the play in in the epilogue and i think it has to happen in the opera I think it's important because, again, it's not just that she is all of us because that's so reductive and simplistic and insulting. Mm -hmm. But she had a name, you know. And if somehow this can have her name spoken, then I want to make sure that that happens. The challenge for me is that, and, and I think this can apply to opera, to theater, really to anything. My challenge is we tell Toyin's story, you tell Toyin's story, the audience takes it in, but because it's art, they leave the theater and they're like, okay, you want to go to Chili's or, you know, like how, how, how do you, how do you deal with the, what, and I know you can't control what audience members think or do after they take in, you know, your your creations. But I guess how do you fare with the sort of tr throwing away the transient, as so many of us tend to do after we go see a movie or a play or these things? I mean, this was a a real person whose story is being told. There must be challenges um, in portraying her story artistically, considering the way we tend to consume art. So. I mean, unfortunately, there's a good bit of letting go that has to happen. Hmm. I mean, it's a making peace. I make peace with that. I, because, but I also, I, but I think it also means my job when I decided to take this on was to make sure that some element of her carried with, carries with, you know, goes with them. Even if it's only the impression of her, you know, at the end, why did this have to happen? And why did this have to happen to this, this beautiful soul? Mm -hmm. I think if I do my job well enough, God willing, um, some of her spirit, if not necessarily her name into perpetuity, lives on if I do my job. And then after that, I have to let it go because yeah, it's ephemeral. It's, it's what it's built to do. It's built to filter out into the ether, into the spirit, you know, into the spirit world. And if that's, you know, if it's okay to say that. Um, 
and then you do it again with another play. You yeah. do it again with another story. And what's it been see. like? What, what what's it been like working um, with the folks who are helping develop this opera? I, I think it goes without saying that our lived experiences are so different than the typical opera professionals lived experience. I'm sure there's been learning probably on both sides. Yeah. I think that the biggest thing I've learned is that it's okay for me to say no. Wow. That's powerful. Yeah. Um, I tend to be open certainly because i think you have to be if you're going to give your if you're going to give something to someone else you're kind of making a trade off i am trading some control um for the benefit of this thing furthering its course whatever that may be mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean you have to say yes to everything and for someone who has sort of you was challenged with the how do I say no? And I learned how to say no. It's like this is okay. This is not. This needs to happen. This I don't need that to happen. And I've, I'm always heard. I think what's interesting. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh. I think what's interesting about this time, the last it's it's filtered off a little. It's petered off a little bit. But the last two years. Um, the global minority has started to feel the weight of what it means to reduce the rest of the world to other. And so many people, Mm. even if it's only because they don't want to feel guilty, will bend over backwards to say yes and to hear your no. In the, the beautiful thing about that is every, everybody does learn. Everybody does get heard. And when you don't, finally there is language in place that says, if you are not hearing, the problem is not the sender. <laughs> yep. <laughs> you know? There's a whole rubric happening that you may want to dismantle and then come back and think about that. No, you know, and so in some ways it's um, frustrating because you feel like you have to. I'm not saying in this case, because in this case, it's been it's been it's been heavenly. But I've watched like in theater what's happening where, you know, there's this rush to say, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh. Well, maybe we, uh, and you're like, mm-hmm. I was waiting for that. I was waiting for the, oh. Yeah. <laughs> um, but again, it's that thing where it's like, well, we'll take what we can get. Because in the meantime, things do change. We are changing things. You and I change things just by walking in the room. And that's literally always been saying. History changes the minute somebody new walks in the room. Yep. You know, we're living in a time where two people can have, they can see literally the same thing, but their life experience will inform them so differently about what that thing is. You no longer get to say that the one with the lightest, you know, the lightest eyes and the seemingly longest history has final say. That's all that's, all that's happened. The world just got bigger. That is literally all that happened. So buckle up and deal with it. (laughs) And one of our previous conversations, one of the things that came to the front was the importance of casting, not Mm -hmm. only when it comes to, you know, are they black or not, but what is their black aesthetic? We were talking specifically about, you know, what folks hair should look like if we're really honoring toy and story. I wonder if you could speak to some of the uh, considerations, some of the things that, you know, you want to see realized visually as this opera comes to life. Yes. Well, I mean, it was really important, I think partly because she is a real person to, I mean, to put it simply, not do what they did to Nina Simone. Listen. (laughs) (laughs) 
just it's a real person yeah and a real person with a very real history of being black and you change that when you dabble with <laughs> when you dabble in well oh, can you be a little this can you be a little that no you can't do it you cannot do it without consequence because bodies have history bodies yeah stories. It was really important that she be natural. It was really important that she be dark skinned. It was, you know, that she wear her hair natural, that she be dark skinned. It was really important that she not have processed hair. It be it was all of these things were important because these are these are who this woman was. And you cannot simply because that's a very different story. If Toyin Salau shows up and her hair is dead. <laughs> the economics of that, just the sheer economics of it. This was a young woman who was unhoused by the end of her life. I've seen the process thing with someone who is unhoused. That's not Toyin. And if you're going to do Toyin's story, you do Toyin's story, body and all. Body first, if nothing else, maybe. Yeah, I don't know. I, yeah. What are some other uh, peripheral aspects that you've been thinking about? I know, again, pre in previous conversations, we talked about who the actual musicians are. Are those yeah. things that matter as this continues to be realized? Matter to you, anyway? They do. I mean, I, you know, I go back and forth with. Um, uh, uh, the gender of the musicians because it says a very different thing if it's all women up there or if it's many women up there if there are men in there and I think I would like to have men in the ensemble because the, the musical ensemble I think I think because this is a community loss. This is a community mm -hmm. loss. And I think that, again, because the bodies matter, the loss and the weight of that loss on each of those ensemble members, I think, needs to be accounted for. I, I, I go back and forth with which is... Um, um, most helpful, most m mindful. But right now I'm sitting in, I'm sitting with, because it's one, excuse me, one vocalist, I think a mix of bodies. But I mean, that may change. I, 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 I'm, I just know it matters. It is significant to me. And I mean, the other, I think the other consideration is that because what happened did have a gender dynamic to it. Yeah. I think it's important to wrestle with that in the, what, who actually appears on stage. And I mean, you could do the, you know, forgive the, uh, uh, the reference, but the sort of, I always imagine Valkyries and Valkyries are all women, you know, I was like, ah, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to something that is mixed. Um, I, I, I don't want men left out of that conversation. You know, I feel like it takes a lot of courage to say something like that because I don't blame a woman, but you know, certainly not a black woman for wanting black femme spaces to only be that. Um, so I, I, I just have to state that, that, that really is a very, impactful to me because it does take a community and so often we will take our pain and again this is not me putting any blame on any black woman who believes in all black spaces i affirm that and it really takes a different way of looking at a thing to acknowledge that community aspect and the degree to which this takes all of our work to change mm -hmm. Vi violence against women is not women's work 
It's all of our work. And that's what I hear you saying. Exactly. It's all of our work. Yeah. I just, I'm, that makes me, that, that, that reinforces in my feeling that it's important. I just, I just think it matters, you know, because, because there is also this and it's probably not fair, but there will be someone, you can't please everyone, but there will be someone who will look at an ensemble and if it's all women, they'll say, see, the men. And then men, black men will be demonized. And that's like, okay, so that was, that was it, be, simply because the bodies say so or the absence of bodies says so. And I don't, I, like you, I'm not, it's not to vilify or to, but I just think it is a, it is a conversation that has to be had. And if we're not going to have it, then who will? We're presenting the work. If we're not willing to have the conversation, who will? We have to. Because, because black men die too. I have to ask you, the, I, I almost hesitate to ask you this question, but you know, considering that we're talking about an opera, yeah. what is a white person's place in this conversation? How do you engage that part of it? You know, especially considering in, in the vast majority, if not all opera performances, it's mostly white folks in the audience at the end of the day. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, it's sort of a... <laughs> And if they, if you build it, they will come thing for me. I think that we're in a moment where white audiences are not trusted hmm. enough, I think. I think that while it is a moment, you know, and the global minority will go back to, well, I want, you know, the ring cycle. I want, you know, I know they'll go back to that. Mm -hmm. I know they will. They just will. We are also in a moment where there are cracks because I don't think that shame or guilt is very useful, but sometimes it's a great tool. And if people feel bad they want to alleviate a little bit of that bad so they go see something where they at least they say they showed up they're like mm. <laughs> <laughs> they showed up and it may not change every mind about what it means to have black bodies in performative space taking space and telling the story but it'll change one it'll change one I mean, I I was just in Edinburgh and uh, went to see uh, Alvin Ailey's uh, International Dance Company. Mm -hmm. Oh, Edinburgh! I looked around; it was like me and one other. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'm sure y'all say hey to each other. <laughs> hey, <laughs> you are right. Yeah, you are right. <laughs> and these people were on their feet at the end, and I don't. You know, at this, and I'll, I'll take it. I'll take it. I don't know if it's because they they checked the box, but they were on their feet because the work itself demanded it. Mm. And when you see, so I think that um, a lot of a lot of uh, what I'm hearing is okay. Well, be careful because you might get disappointed. You might be, you know, and I I'm more curious than I am wary. Because I think that if you build it, they will come. And when the work is good, and I think Jason's work is really good, they'll give it a listen. It won't be fun, but art doesn't necessarily have to be fun, you know? Well, for people, of, for people of all stripes who want to keep up with you, uh, learn more about you and your work, and check out this opera once it's completed, how can they do that? Oh, uh, I am constantly yelling my head off on Instagram <laughs> at June Carroll, <laughs> June, J-U-N-E-C-A-R-R-Y-L. Um, I'm also on Facebook, uh, but I'm mostly yelling on, on Instagram. And 
Yeah, that's that kind of the one. Yeah, I'm like, mm-hmm. I'm starting to get on threads, but I don't know. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm staying off of there too. Never even downloaded TikTok, so you can't talk <laughs> to me about that. <laughs> <laughs> I did download TikTok, I will admit, because there's this one guy, a uh, rock star, who does the best animal videos on the planet guy (laughs) who are like having conversations and he's hilarious. (laughs) So I wanted to uh, wrap up by taking us back to Denver. Yeah. If you walked into your high school, walked into a literature class at your high school, what would you tell those students considering everything that you've gone through, all of your experiences, what would be your words to them? Um, my words would be words matter. Read everything you can get your hands on. If you're not into, um, fiction, read nonfiction, not in nonfiction, read plays. Those are short poems. There is such an incredible world. I thank my teachers so much. Mr. Sims was the other one. Um, I thank my teachers so much for saying, here's a book. Um, because words can set you free. I, I, it sounds silly, but there is nothing like being in a classroom and telling some kid, you know, you've got a story. What'd you do today? Well, I did this and I did this and then this happened. And then I didn't like that so much because you just told me your story. When that kid realizes I have something to say, that whole invisibility thing in the world being determined to exterminate you, you can't touch them ever again. So I would say, read and tell your story. A bit more there of Say Her Name by Alicia Lee, featuring Alicia with the University of Michigan Choruses. And huge thanks once again to June Carroll for joining me this week to talk about her life, her work, her upbringing, um, and the work that she's doing to lift up the name Oluwatoyin Salau. This is uh, one instance of uh, of uh, an activist disappearing, uh, being the victim of violent crime at the hands of men. And it's something that we we need to pay attention to. So I'm so, so, so grateful uh, for June and all of her work, not only sharing this news um, and this uh, this circumstance with the public, but doing so artistically, not only uh, through her medium of of the stage, the theater, uh, but also branching out into opera to make sure as many people know about this story as possible. Really appreciate uh, getting to share that with y'all this week. So I wanted to briefly close Uh, by addressing what's happening in the Middle East. I've seen a lot of people make statements or even take sides. And um, I I thought I would offer what I could based on my experiences and even what I've shared here on the Triloquy podcast. So it's it's been a, a journey for me thinking about, you know, over the past over a decade, what's going on over there in the Middle East. And when I think about um the whole issue. I'm thinking about black people. I'm thinking about uh, brown people, people of color who lived somewhere for many, many, many generations who are being pushed out now. But before I go any further, I'm not taking sides. I think my point is that we have been so used to taking sides that uh, the result of, of what's been going on over there has been more violence, more more harm, more more murdered children, more murdered women, more more murdered w- men. I know that there's some footage out there that I personally am not going to watch um, because I don't need any sort of murder porn in my life right now. But you know what I think is most healthy for us to do right now is to think about what peace could look like and how we aren't uh, going in that direction by saying this party is wrong. This party deserves to be there. This party doesn't deserve to be there. They started it. They did this. They did that. I'm seeing a lot of that on social media. Um, I'm seeing people saying they stand with one side or the other. 
And, you know, I, I feel like it's just such a complex issue and such a generations long issue. Um, not to say that, you know, there isn't harm that has to be named because that has to be named. But at the same time, we aren't doing anything to help the situation by posting statements or 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 putting anything out there that makes one group over the other wrong. Historically, I have been very, very, very outspoken about my support of Palestine and my critique of of that support not being something that is allowed or something especially that black people here in the United States can do without being accused of anti-Semitism. I think that is a separate conversation. What we're seeing right now is so horrible and so violent. We need to think about how we can um, inspire thoughts of peace and thoughts of solidarity across the board so that, you know, we can put the guns down, we can we can put the violence away and figure out, you know, what are the the actual histories behind the situation and if there's anything that we can do to actually support. I know that there are uh, black professors here in the United States that bring students over there to, you know, offer aid. I, I know that uh, our administration, our a political administration is offering uh, financial and other supports to one side. So there's, there's a lot going on, but you know what what i what i'm really taking away from this situation from what i'm hearing from people and reading in the news is that we need to figure out this solidarity piece um the us versus them isn't going to work and i was having this conversation with uh, somebody recently i can't uh, remember who it is you know it it it, it can sound pollyanna uh, for us to say let's all get along or or let's all just you know figure out a way to get there together but the longer that i am alive and do the work that i do the more that I see that as what has to be done, you know, following um, the murder of George Floyd, it was very difficult for me to engage positively with white people. And then, you know, as as longtime listeners know, I found Nietzsche and Buddhism and, you know, really have been tapping into the um, innate value of all human life and every single human being that goes for the Jews, that goes for the Palestinians, that goes for the people I like, that goes for the people that challenge me, that goes for the racists, that goes for the musicians, that goes for the status quo keepers, the status quo um, shakers. It's, it's really something that I think we all need to get more into if we can determine how, as individuals, we can value all life, I think that'll be a really great first step into having the dialogues and really being engaged in a way that just might lead to peace. World peace is something that I believe can happen. And we all have to do our part in figuring out how we do that. So how do I tie this back to the arts? Um, if I were on live radio right now, I would be... Uh, putting a lot of effort into um, highlighting ensembles like the East Western Divan Orchestra that um, have Palestinians, Jewish people, and everyone uh, in between in this ensemble. I think they've been going since 1999. Uh, there's some really incredible recordings of uh, Jewish music out there that are both ceremonial um, and of the people, folk music, if you will. There's some really incredible CDs out there uh, by the Syrian National Orchestra and, um, and other ensembles. Uh, whose cultures are more aligned with um, Islam uh, and, and Palestinian music. I remember at WUOT, um, I used to play some Sufi music all the time, which is like some um, Islamic uh, mysticism. The, uh, the, uh, the guy who um, works at the bodega uh, near our place here in New York, he's uh, into Sufism. So we've been talking about uh, those things anyway. There are things that we can do as artists that can help others uh, see the innate value of all people. We really can be that example by highlighting the music, by highlighting the cultures, by highlighting the stories, and in our everyday lives, encouraging the people that we dialogue with or engage with to understand that all human life is valuable and that what's most important is figuring out ways to end the violence and to get us to a place uh, where we can actually figure out, you know, again, how we can be a positive part of what's going on over there instead of funding one side to kill each other or to blame one side for, for whatever. I think it's disgusting. I think it's absolutely horrific that we have to, uh, that, that we have to resort to that sort of thing. You know, there's a book called The Human Revolution, uh, one of the uh, Buddhist texts that uh, that we read. It's a hard book to find. I'm fortunate enough to have a copy, but the first sentence of the book um, says, 
um, I, I, and forgive me if I'm uh, misquoting, but uh, my memory is that it says there's nothing more egregious than war. So think about all the things that you know, you've gone through in your life or all the things I talk about here on the Triloquy podcast, whether it's the status quo of classical music, where it's whether it's systemic racism, the murder of unarmed people uh, by the police. All of that is horrible, but I agree there is nothing more egregious than war. So how are we going to Im- impact this dialogue and, and ultimately the circumstance positively? I think it's highlighting, again, the innate value of all people, all cultures, and whatever way we can, whether that's broadcasting music, whether that's doing research about music, if you're a conductor programming um, music that highlights the uh, value of people on both sides of this issue, um, all toward you know just being that example for the rest of the world. I think we can do it. The arts has always led the way, maybe not classical music, but uh, music in general has always led the way when it comes to political discourse and political action. It's time for classical music institutions to turn off the blinders, to take off the blinders, and really take part in this uh, by highlighting everything we can that showcases the value and worth of all people on all sides of this situation. Thank you so much for listening. It's always a pleasure uh, to be with you. Sorry that this is coming out a little late, but, uh, you know, (laughs) better late than never. And I'll talk to y'all again next week. Peace.